Thank you for the intro. Um, I started in late 2012, around the time that um, Silk Road was starting to make headlines. Damn, so 12 years. You're more than a decade into this thing. Yeah, I think it's more like 11 since it was late 20. I don't know what the math is, but yes, more than a decade. Um, it's uh, been, it's amazing that that much time has actually passed because I, I don't know, I basically turned full-time Bitcoin like the week I discovered it. What? And I, well, it wasn't like formal, <laughs> but it was, in other words, like I became so obsessed with it that it basically, it took some time, but it basically ended up consuming me to where I like wound down my business and wanted to do Bitcoin things. And so I just replaced my life more and more with it. I was taking any profits from my business and buying Bitcoin with it. And so it was uh, it, like immediately something that, that pulled me in. Yeah. And, but, but you're a tech guy, right? Because you're not, you're not coming from business necessarily or investment. So did you see, did you look at Bitcoin already as an investment back then and like putting a lot of your wealth into it? Or were you more like interested in tech and how did that maybe develop over time and change over time over these 10 years? Well, I don't know what a tech guy is, but I'll know, I know how to answer your question at least. Um, because like people say, oh, I'm not a technical person. And I don't really, I don't know, this feels almost like I'm ignorant and I want to stay that way. Or I'm inexperienced and I think you're more experienced than me. And it, like the context matters, but um Anyway, the, the point being like back then what I was, was uh, uh, an entrepreneur, I guess. I had my own business that we were um, pretty small, but we were doing a lot of business in our local area, doing branding, design, and any supported services for small businesses. So basically like we could make your whole brand, make your website, handle all of your ad placement, doing, you know, if you wanted to do mailers and, you know, this was uh, some time ago, so marketing was a little bit different. It was changing a lot, but um, making a lot of WordPress sites for people, making entire like menus and brands for restaurants, things like this. Um, so was I technical? I don't know. I've been using computers all of my life, but I'm not a programmer. Um, I've built my own computers long, you know, early when I was young. And so I, I guess that makes me technical, but um, none of that had much to do with why I liked Bitcoin. Um, the reason why I liked Bitcoin and pulled me in was because of the, maybe the anti-authority, self-sovereign stuff about it. Um, I literally bought the Bitcoin so I could buy drugs on Silk Road. That's why I bought it. Um, and my interest, it was half because I wanted to get some weed and I didn't know nobody in my neighborhood. And I thought, oh, that'd be, that'd be interesting. But the main half was just, wait, you can do this? You know, like this is possible. And I wanted to understand why. Um, and that's what kept me here. Um, that's what, you know, but that, that pulled me in. It was, it was definitely, I owe it, I owe it to Ross Albrecht and um, the Silk Road for pulling me in. Um, and yeah, I'm, I guess I'm rambling, but uh, that's another reason why I think it'd be really nice to get him out of prison. And it doesn't yeah, seem absolutely. we have any way to do that. Yeah, but, this, was a, yeah. this was a huge thing. I, I was not into Bitcoin yet, but the, that but then when you got into bitcoin and i got into bitcoin like 2015 this was still a big this was the big story right uh, then and right afterwards i think 2016 then came mount gox and so then that was the big story and obviously now ftx is maybe the big story or whatever but um yeah back then i mean i, I was also uh, just really hyped about the uh, potential of Bitcoin because there is no central authority, because there is no bank that could just, you know, that you can freeze it for you or block it for you, that you, you need a bank to hold your money. No, you can do it yourself peer to peer and it's open source and it's global and it's neutral and it's, you know, no, uh, um, uh, uh, no government can print more of it. So that's really what these, these key features of Bitcoin, which I think uh, all of us who are a bit, liberal a bit open to innovation etc uh it really it really hooks us right and then uh you you get obsessed how did this how did this obsession um move you forward into then working on like what were the first thing things you then started working on in bitcoin because i mean bitcoin was not an industry then right it was maybe a couple of my yeah. couple of uh, geeks that were using it but uh how, how did you find your first kind of professional steps into bitcoin 
So first I'll comment on, you mentioned the obsessive aspect. I do think that Bitcoin appeals probably to a certain personality type, someone that like is used to or uh, inclined to be someone that likes to research and obsess over something they discover on the internet and, you know, this kind of thing. And, and Bitcoin definitely caters to somebody who is like that, you know, because it's not just self so You just learn, all, you just get pulled into all these new concepts, you know, like learning about what money, what money is and debating about it. And people get really, you know, deep into that rabbit hole and the, you know, peer to peer networks and cryptography and game theory and all of these things people start talking about that you've either just maybe heard of before or never even heard of. And now you want to like learn all about all of them and how they interact. And it's like you're building like this whole entire new area of mental model in your brain. And it's, it's very stimulating for somebody like me, I guess, and probably a lot of Bitcoiners. Um, as far as how I got into the professional side of Bitcoin, um, around 2016, um, there was the whole Bitcoin Uncensored, guys. I don't know if you remember that. Um, I, I, I dabbled in some other things before that, but you know, this would be the, the main time period where there was basically a, like a podcast or live streaming Bitcoin show with these two guys that had a very kind of practical take on Bitcoin. You know, you could call a maximalist, but it was a little bit different. Um, and they were kind of like shock jocks. I don't know if you know what this concept is, but um, or probably a lot of European people might not. And so I'll, I'll define it a little bit, but shock jocks kind of like Howard Stern and how Howard Stern got famous. We had a lot of this in the US where there were radio hosts. It's not a thing really anymore, but um, when radio was bigger, we had a lot of different radio hosts and they had to become like personalities and they had to be like, get attention. And so a subculture of kind of shock jocks, which meant like the person who hosted the show was trying to like elicit shocking responses by his behavior. Mm -hmm. And so How Howard Stern is the most famous example because he got famous by like having like hookers on his show and interviewing them and things like this. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin Uncensored did the same thing. Like they interviewed people that were using Bitcoin to buy drugs and, mm -hmm. and for, you know, selling sex and, and just uh, various weird people for like that had nothing to do with Bitcoin. They would interview scammers in Bitcoin before, mm -hmm. you know, like the whole culture of, of being a scam hunter in Bitcoin, they really pushed that forward a lot. Anyway, that's a lot of detail to say around that time they were, as a joke, were streaming on uh, an adult video cam website, like an adult chat website, and they would stream their show on there. And it was in this website accepted Bitcoin only for tipping and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got... I got this website got my attention. And so I decided to basically join that team and turn it into like a full product. And so that's how I ended up getting connected to Romania is my business partner in that venture was Romanian. And I was going through a divorce at the time. So I decided to travel and visit them. And I just ended up staying in Romania for a few years. So that was kind of the most formal business, you know, uh, getting into the professional side. I did dabble in other things. Like there was a time we tried to do a Bitcoin core like PR or marketing arm and that that died very quickly because what you what you learn is there is no narrative that you can get everybody to agree on. Even when you think you're talking to people that agree, once it when it comes to like portraying a narrative, they don't agree. Um and there should yeah. maybe there should not be one single entity that is tasked um, to do a certain to, to push a certain narrative around Bitcoin, right? Or or be the marketing or PR department about Bitcoin. I think there have been many uh, attempts as well for you know overarching global uh, Bitcoin association. Or Bitcoin. It, it was a reaction to that kind of the, the Bitcoin Foundation was pretty scammy and you know, many people's opinion, at least. Um, and it was kind of like a reaction to say like, oh, and, and really people that the community felt were like bad representatives were getting like interviews about Bitcoin on TV and, and, and news was always going to like the strangest people. And, you know, the, the scammiest people would try to intercept being the voice of Bitcoin. And so we thought, oh, well, maybe we can do this in a way that's a little more, you know, practical or, or truthful. 
but it just turns out to be just a bad idea in general. Yeah, it's, it's cooler if it's like more decentralized in a way that some companies, small or big companies, and some, now even like BlackRock, who maybe could be viewed as, you know, the enemy, but still they're now also advocating their story for bit their narrative for Bitcoin. You know, a lot of politicians are building their narrative for or against Bitcoin, but I think that's fine, right? It should be kind of decentralized also on that layer, you know, on the marketing uh, layer, because, you know, if you have something like Ethereum with their own foundation or Tesos, you know, investing hundreds of millions into getting projects going and doing PR and media, et cetera. It's, just, it's, not, it's not the way how you build a robust, really decentralized peer-to-peer -peer open source network, right? It will, it will centralize then uh, around that entity and it can also be attacked uh, by this one entity then. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, not to get philosophical, but there are a lot of topics of things that centralize in Bitcoin and ETFs are one of them. So, you know, while, while you can claim the ETF as decentralizing in one context, you can also claim it's extremely centralizing in another context. So it, nuance is important when discussing decentralization, as well as definition, like people like to have very creative or convenient definitions of decentralization when they're having conversations sometimes. How do you think uh, an ETF is centralizing Bitcoin in what way? Well, you are putting literally putting thousands to hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin in the hands of one entity. I mean, it's blatant centralization. And so what, yeah, well, centralization of ownership also begets centralization of all types because like I'll give you, I, I'll play out a scenario for you, like as an example. Um, I forget which one, BitShares, one of the ETFs committed to giving some percentage of their profits to Bitcoin Core Development. Yeah, right. Okay, well, so they end up having to choose some way to distribute that money, right? They will either choose themselves and create some kind of standards or more likely outsource the standards to someone like Brink or something like this. So now you've created a centralized entity holding many, many Bitcoin, creating a revenue flow into core development. Um, and now you eventually have developers dependent on their revenue stream. You have, now you have developers incentivized to continue to get that revenue, revenue stream. Um, and so thus they end up shaping their projects and their applications competitively to try to cater to the people in charge of distributing that revenue. <laughs> and eventually this hardens over time, the bigger it gets. And so you could end up with like, say for even now, core development isn't, isn't that diverse. It's pretty diverse, but now imagine if like, 40% of core development is funded by an ETF and then 30% is funded by block. And then, you know what I mean? And it starts looking like, okay, like, and then you have, and say all of these are now, say the culture develops and now they're all competing to introduce soft forks that benefit their vision for their own ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it just becomes very hard to navigate because now you, the, the people with the power and the people that hold the Bitcoin and the people that flow the funding all have influence. And this happens in every case, whether it be Coinbase holding many Bitcoin or BitGo holding many Bitcoin, mm -hmm. these things have centralizing effects. Hi, hier ist Joel von Relay und heute möchte ich dir etwas über Relay Private erzählen. Relay Private ist unser Exclusive Service für Privatleute, Leute mit größerem Budget, Family Offices, klein- und mittelgroßere Unternehmen oder einfach Leute, die in größerem Volumen Bitcoin kaufen wollen. Als Kunde von Relay Private hast du die Möglichkeit und Zugang zu einem exklusiven Team. Wir sind 24-7 für dich da, beantworten all deine Fragen und können dir gegebenenfalls in Notfällen natürlich auch aushelfen. Du bekommst außerdem einen rund um die Uhr Support und hast zusätzlich auch Zugang zu unseren branchenspezifischen Reports und Details, die wir immer an unsere Relay Private Kunden senden. Wenn das für dich interessant ist oder du jemanden kennst, für den das interessant sein könnte, dann sende ihn zu relay.app slash private oder klicke. Ja, yeah, and it's just a lot of power, right? If you, if you just hold hundreds of thousands of, of Bitcoin in one entity, be it MicroStrategy or be it the US government, which I think holds more than 200,000 confiscated Bitcoin or big miners sometimes holding. I think a bit, wasn't Bitmain one of the main 
funders of core developers still until until a couple of years ago. And so Bitmain didn't always have the best interest, right? They they also they were big blockers, for example. They wanted to also centralize more and more of this. Maybe many miners are into ordinals, so they would you know push this narrative etc so yeah I, I yeah guess. or is another good example like you have now a, a conflict in the culture of whether or not ordinals should be you know uh, seen as legitimate supported you know filtered whatever you want to call it and so this creates more distraction more noise um the the utility what people define as the utility of bitcoin becomes more distorted mm -hmm. um and more questionable and yeah, so the more complexity, I guess, is another thing that breeds yeah. centralization. Yeah, for sure. It's important to think about these things as well. Um, so when talking about ordinals, and lately we had this huge fee spikes, right? Um, I think it was a new record of almost 700 v -sat, uh, sats per v byte, whereas, you know, uh, still probably one or two years ago, you could still get away with uh, one sat per byte transaction. It, it might might have taken you a couple of days or even a week, but it worked. Now, and, and the, the average was still below 10 sats per byte. You could send you know, a, a transaction with even high um, priority uh, you know, for eight, nine sats per byte. Now we were at almost 700 on average for, for a high prior transaction, which is crazy. Uh, so we felt that, for example, because we are a non-custodial broker and we were sending a lot of also small transactions to our users, we felt that a lot. It, was, it, it became our second biggest cost um, <laughs> per month uh, in December when we had this, this huge spike. And there was already one spike in May. So they kind of tend to come and go, but this time was very clearly because of these ordinals and BRC20 tokens and inscriptions, et cetera, that really bloated the network and uh, led to all these high fees. How, how do you see that? Is this going to come back always? Like, will I think if you look on the long term horizon, a couple of years, then you definitely see that the um, uh, the development is going up. Like the, the fees are increasing almost linearly, uh, definitely just increasing, increasing, increasing. And then sometimes there are these peaks. How will this move on in the next, let's say, five to 10 years? And how, how, how do you think we or the, the Bitcoin community ecosystem should tackle that when, you know, if it goes on like this in a couple of years, um, small transactions like 10, 20 bucks will not be possible anymore on the main chain, at least, right? Yeah, it's a nuanced topic, so the context is important. Um, I think that if you're trying to design for how to scale Bitcoin, you know, you know, there are people that believe in using custodial things or sharing ETXOs or on-chain scaling. Um, I think I tend to think that all of the complexity is worse than on-chain scaling. But in the context of ordinals and all this stuff, well, you have to zoom out for a second and remember that you don't know what any Bitcoin transaction actually represents. Like anybody can make a private, you know, layer or network or whatever they want and define any transaction however they want and validate it however they want. And a Bitcoiner doesn't know about it. So if you want to start like accusing of spam or things like this, I think that the mental model to look at it in a healthy way is just to say, there is a trend right now of people using Bitcoin a certain way. Um, that is evident. Whether that trend is also an attack or manipulation or something like this, you can't know. All you can know is there's a trend and people are paying for block space to you know satisfy that trend. And do we think this trend will be long term? Well, the trend of ordinals and NFTs and stuff on Bitcoin? No, I don't think that will be long term. This is a guess. I'm speculating. But so I don't think that we should change Bitcoin, make the blocks bigger, you know, add risky, complex softworks just because of ordinals and inscriptions. No, I don't think we should do it because of that, because I think we need to see how this plays out over time. Um, now, fees are exclusive right and so like you said if the fees become 25 30 dollars you know consistently then what you're doing is you're excluding a certain class of utility a class of people even 
Um, and so if Bitcoin ends up only being useful to people that want to make inscriptions, that's just the reality of it. Um, I'm highly skeptical that that's accurate reality and true or will play out that way. And so I think it's unhealthy to get like too crazy and mad at ordinals because it's going to keep happening. People, every time the block space will become underpriced, you could argue, then people will apply use cases to Bitcoin that fit within that low price until it becomes out of scale. Um, another example would be like paying for coffee on chain, right? Like when fees are basically nothing, you can, and it's no problem. Um, but when fees are $25, well, you're not going to buy your coffee on chain. Um, and the issue with fees being exclusive is a lot of Bitcoiners think of the cost to run a node being exclusive. When I say exclusive, I don't mean like cool. I mean excluding. <laughs> um, and so inclusive versus exclusive. And so, you know, people think, oh, if we make the blocks too big or we make, we make big Bitcoin too expensive to run, then we'll get less users and more, we'll have more centralization because there'll be less nodes. But you need economic nodes, people that are verifying actual UTXOs they own. And so you have to facilitate usage on chain as well. So you have to kind of try to figure out this balance because if you have too little block space, it's very centralizing too. You're basically saying Bitcoin is for the elite and only the elite can afford, only people who hold many Bitcoin can hold, can afford to send Bitcoin, these kinds of things. It's extremely centralizing just from the other end of the spectrum. So you have to try to figure out like where the edges are and try to stay between them. This is active management, also not recommended. You don't want to have an active monetary policy. You don't really want to have a dynamic monetary policy. Um, and I, and I call it a monetary policy because I consider all resources of Bitcoin to be representative of like the, the, state or the permanent size of Bitcoin. When you increase block space, you're, it's not that much different than increasing the amount of Bitcoin in a conceptual way. Like you have to, whenever you scale Bitcoin, if you, if you don't add more value into it, more users, more transactions that you couldn't have done before, then it becomes a cost to the current users somehow. Like people will fill it with spam and now the current users have to carry that spam. Like, so it is all a balancing act and just manipulating it at all is risky because you're just speculating on what the solution is. I know that's maybe a long answer and I went around a few contexts there, but I do think all the nuance is important because people are very knee jerk about these topics. It is very important. So, but, so what do you see concretely in terms of what technologies uh, will enable scalability? How do you see scalability? Uh, so that everyone, even the small, you know, the, the person who wants to buy and use 10 bucks worth of Bitcoin can still uh, use it and profit from, from Bitcoin. Yeah, I think everybody will answer this different and certainly people will answer it differently than me. Um, but I think from the practical side, like the definition of scaling a network is simply adding more resources to it, more cost, more expense, more overhead in order to achieve more throughput or more storage or more processing power, whatever it may be, you need more actual resource to scale something. Mm -hmm. And because Bitcoin requires every single node to do every single thing a node does, not every single thing, but most of the things, um, then that, that's why they say Bitcoin doesn't scale. It doesn't mean that Bitcoin, you cannot add more resources to Bitcoin and make it bigger. It just means when you do so, you have the minimum amount of efficiency because everybody has to do it, maximum redundancy. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means you have to accept the trade-offs if you do it. And so the trade-offs there are, if you face, say, for example, make blocks bigger, Then you make nodes more expensive to run permanently. You make data, the size of Bitcoin bigger permanently. Um, but there are various ways you can kind of measure those costs, research what type of demographics of, of use cases and people that it may affect. Like there's plenty of intelligent, you know, science-based work that could be done to manage that method. That's why I call it practical. 
On the more speculative and maybe what I would call impractical side, you have people trying to invent things. You know, you have people trying to say, what if we add covenants and we use covenants for this? What if we add, uh, or what if we build a whole VM on top of Bitcoin and do that? What if we, everybody's trying to speculate on complexity. The issue with, with complexity as a scaling method is that it's a centralizing force, right? And so, no matter what, you're still having to make that trade off. And so what is the, as an example, let's say compare the costs of inventing lightning, implementing lightning across all the lightning industry, getting the lightning user experience to be good to the costs of, if that, if, of redistributing all that effort to, if we had focused more on Bitcoin being easier to send on chain and cheaper to send on chain. Mm -hmm. Now, doing an actual analysis of that and trying to you know guesstimate what the actual differences would be in cost would be very interesting mm -hmm. and i don't think that i think bitcoiners would be surprised or disappointed in the results i think you would probably find that lightning was extremely wasteful as far as you know uh the amount of gains that we get for scaling compared to the costs and if you compared it to other options that said Lightning is by far the best complex thing that we have at the moment. Um, I, I think that things like sharing UTXOs, you know, co you know covenant-based solutions, things like this, I'm I'm highly skeptical of those things. Um, I think that they have either the same, or worse, or the same or worse trade-offs as Lightning, and Lightning is already extremely complex. I know you guys are implementing, say, uh, I'm just guessing here, but you guys are implementing Greenlight, right? And you're doing this API, which could be argued this is the easiest way to implement Lightning right now, self custodially. I think that you, you you would agree, and that's probably a big reason why you chose it, right? Mm -hmm. But I bet, and I haven't asked anybody the first one. I'm asking here. I bet you still are finding it very complicated, and the user experience is very nuanced. Yeah. And getting this to all be something where you're not getting a bunch of support tickets every day, and the use and unhappy users and failed experiences. I bet it's still hard for you, even though you're using the easiest thing that you could. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, we have <laughs> users now on it, and it is already. It is still very complex. We're not there yet, and then, but still, we will be brave and reckless and actually launch it to all of our hundred thousand active users soon i, don't know. I, I mean yeah we're, we're doing we're doing it i would say an even harder way um because we're doing ldk and we're not doing the api method my whole point here is just that there that regular bitcoiners don't really understand the actual uh complexity here they just do not really grasp it and so when they when i hear bitcoiners like saying oh well, what we can do is we can have, you know, a world that is like 200 or 2000 fediments and they're all bridging over lightning network. And I'm just like, like, this is not, you're never going to scale this. Like it's, it's not going to happen. Um, trying to convert, you're just going to end up centralizing all this complexity to an exchange and the exchange is going to be the major point of failure for your whole system. And I could get into what, why that is, but yeah, I'm, ranting enough probably <laughs> okay yeah so i mean you you're, what would you're saying is that lightning is the way to go currently for scale it's like the best thing we have currently for scaling bitcoin but it's not going to be the silver bullet it's not going to be oh once lightning is there the scaling problem is solved there will be more. i think it's worth trying to make it as close to a silver bullet as possible but i think it's not in not that likely that it will be a silver bullet. I guess maybe another way to look at it could be that, you know, I mentioned practical methods and impractical message and I, and I compared on chain to complexity, but it's also that like, um, no, I lost my train of thought. What was I going to say? Um, the, the, the complexity, I don't know. I, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. You can edit that out. <laughs> no worries. But, but so you, I mean, with BitKit, you are working on lightning, right? So, what you're saying is okay yeah lightning is it might not be the silver bullet it's the best thing we have now it's the best thing we have now you don't see another alternative that would be worth your time and your team's time to spend on kind of scaling bitcoin you, you're saying like there should be a lot of people you know putting their resources their time etc and a lot of money and you're, you're you're funded as well like a, a lot of resource into lightning that makes sense yeah, like I think I think that over time it's possible we can get the user experience to be 
as reliable as a user would expect. Um, I, I think we can get pretty close. Do I think, you know, it's going to be like we get between 80 and 95% there. And is that 5 to 20% going to be acceptable to the user? I'm not sure. That, I, I, can't, I can't predict that. Well, the, the the issue is just still that like it's still gonna like it, for example if we if we don't increase the block size and this enlightening is not enough, then the fees are say twenty five dollars. Like the user experience of onboarding a user to Lightning having to pay twenty five dollars or an accidental force close costing twenty five dollars. This really puts a huge gear in like so many things with Lightning. Yeah. It, it makes it really really tricky. So yeah, I. I I guess what I was what I was trying to say earlier um, is like I mentioned on chain scaling, I mentioned complexity, but um, this is partly like the reason why Lightning is the only thing is because it's made out of Bitcoin transactions. That's why I don't mention like Liquid or the things people call layers because they're actually totally separated from Bitcoin because there's a trusted need to bridge them. And so if I, I think that it's possible people will invent more things like Lightning, like. I think, for example, ARC is built out of Bitcoin transactions as well. Um, but it's also complex and has trade-offs. And so we, we, I, I, I'm holding out to see what the user experience is. But it's possible that there, you know, there's another aspect of failing we didn't discuss, which is making things smaller and making things simpler. Um, so the if complexity is centralizing, then simplicity is decentralizing, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can reduce node costs, you can reduce implementation costs, maintenance costs, support costs, all by reducing complexity. So if there's research to say compress transaction behavior, compress transactions themselves, make make the overall weight of Bitcoin transactions smaller, make the complexity you know some more simplified. For example, I'm not saying I'm going to advocate this, but like probably a practical way, if you really are concerned about ordinals and, and this kind of thing, probably the only like adult thing to suggest is like removal of taproot. Like if you want to make these things not practical, you can say, look, we made Bitcoin more complex and this is what happened. So maybe we should not have this kind of complexity on chain. Now you're going to get all kinds of people saying you're crazy for suggesting that. But from the standpoint of, okay, I actually want Bitcoin to not be for more random use cases, you have to remove complexity. Because when you add complexity, you add utility, you add more opportunity, you add more surface area, more, more grooves in the surface area. You know what I mean? Like the complexity is something that is also anti-scaling. Yeah and, it, yeah, and all these improvements on chain or on different layers and even on, you know, uh, uh, other applications that you would not call layers, but that still help scale um, Bitcoin. And these can be centralized uh, companies, even like custodians, like ETFs, for example. I mean, somehow it is a scaling way. It is a way to scale Bitcoin and bring Bitcoin to more people. Right, so you can. Say well, you have to define scaling because, like, are you scaling what? Scaling Bitcoin, scaling people's exposure to Bitcoin as an investment, like, because th that's where the the nuance gets lost. Is you know, I'll try to have a conversation about actual technical scaling of Bitcoin to be to to get it more capacity to make more people be able to create actual Bitcoin transactions. But then people will mention, you know, custodial things. And I'm just saying like, okay, now imagine I came to you and I said, give me the best plan for scaling banks into Bitcoin. You would describe the same behavior. You would say, oh, let's get an ETF out there. Let's, you know, get, get great custodial wallets out there to compete with the bad user experience of self-custodial wallets. Let's get everything as centralized as possible. So it's as cheap as possible, you know, like that's how you would scale custody, right? And then at that point, the only thing that really matters is, is who you trust, who, who you know, who who you will, will have your custody. Whether they're using a federation or confidential transactions, or you know, they can you know give you audits. All these things are just not that important because in the end, you have to trust the person holding the money. Yeah, if you want that, and some some might want 
that. Some want to trust um, BlackRock and Coinbase and therefore they think for themselves it's the most convenient and the best option to just hold Bitcoin. That way, some just want to trust Binance for whatever reason um, to hold their Bitcoin and some want to go the, a bit more um, you know, the bit harder way with a bit more effort and, and try to do it themselves. And then they run into other problems because they have a non-custodial wallet now and everything and it works until it doesn't because the fees are so high and then they will need to go into Lightning. And the question is, Lightning or non-custodial Lightning? I mean, custodial or non-custodial Lightning because you can use Bitcoin and Lightning through something like Strike. But it's definitely, it's, it's highly custodial. Again, you're trusting a lot of different intermediaries and parties again. So then if you really want to go the pure way of uh, as low as like no custody, no KYC, et cetera, then I think that's always going to be harder. Uh, so always going to be for, for, for less people. And we, both of our startups are you know, working very hard on making that uh, because that's pure. That's what we want. That's like the idealistic um, uh, thing. That's the real thing. And we want people to use, to be able to use that. And I think we will achieve from maybe 1% of the Bitcoin users now that really are able to use that to more, to hopefully, you know, uh, half of the world. But I think there will always be people that are just like, yeah, I want my bank to take care of it or I want BlackRock to take care of it, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't... I'm not trying to say that we should disallow people from doing anything or using, you know, uh, banks or trusting people. I think that if the context is what is the best way to solve my problem, and if a bank is the best way to solve my problem, so be it. Um, I just think when the context is growing Bitcoin, Bitcoin adoption, scaling Bitcoin, that it's better to organize the conversation to separate that and say, okay, yeah. well, for for the aspirations we have for Bitcoin and growing it, we hear our options. And I just don't think that the ET, an ETF or people holding their Bitcoin in ETF is an example of relief on our responsibility to create those options. It, it doesn't, it doesn't help us at all. Um, I want to mention another thing too, because you mentioned that it's easier. Um, there is a, a benefit trade-off for us as well in that, Yes, it's much harder to work on self-custodial apps um, and deliver good user experiences for self-custodial situations, but it also means that we don't have to do uh, have compliance or as much compliance. We don't have to have uh, as much of our work be about lawyers and yep. dealing with state organizations and things like this. So that, that's really what the game is. It's like seeing how much can we keep our companies away from becoming, you know, an arm of the government and just having a bunch of lawyers and bankers working for us. You know? That's a very good, good point you're making. And uh, I think it can be, hopefully, it can go that far that um, how, using and holding and transaction with Bitcoin in, an, in a self-custodial way will be even easier than doing it in a high KYC, high regulated custodial way. Because if you're looking looking at, especially here in Europe now, the whole Mika licensing that will uh, Mika framework that will come from 2025 onwards, boy, this is make this is gonna make it super hard and super inefficient, super costly uh, for these big custodial shitcoin exchanges. Especially if you also have other cryptos than Bitcoin. So if you're not if you, if you, if you're not um, Bitcoin only, and if you're not non custodial. It will be super hard, super inefficient, super uh, costly uh, for you to run the business. And it's going to be impossible for small businesses. And it's going to be hard to deliver a great, uh, fast, slick user experience. Because it's exactly what you said, because it's mainly like you're, you're just over-regulated. Uh, and if you're Bitcoin only and non-custodial, you can be a small company, you can be nimble, you can um, be also cheap. Um, you, we will probably be able to... Uh, provide a better user experience, uh, be faster also in developing because we're a small and lean company and we'd be even cheaper. You know, uh, that, that, that's yeah, cool. you might have a point. Um, I don't know if it will all be like that, but there is a chance. There's, there's actually a reasonable chance that the Bitcoin or maybe even the Lightning user experience could end up being less of a headache than the fiat experience 
post Bitcoin. <laughs> in other words, now that everybody's trying to like regulate the hell out of everything and make CBDCs and all this stuff, you know, if we take a, if we zoom out and like look at things five, 10 years from now, it might be that, well, all that stuff is much more of a pain in the ass than Bitcoin. A, a practical example right now is how Bitcoin is 24 hours a day and nobody can tell you when you can or can't move it. Um, that's not going to be true for ETF holders. They're not going to be have full freedom to be liquid, full freedom to transfer, etc. Yeah, exactly. Or limits, uh, you know, credit card limits of one or two k a day. There's nothing like that on on Bitcoin. Yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. lot of limitations, and they. Oh, uh, it's getting really annoying, man. Like my card gets like shut down anytime I spend more than a thousand. It's like. They like have like get a fraud alert or something like that. It's like you, the amount is just getting lower and lower. It's like it feels like the only purpose of my bank now is like to give me fraud alerts that are wrong. Like <laughs> they're just control trying to control you more and more, and they but they're not capable of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. I think that's the future we want to work on, right? That's that's what we want. That using money and transaction value becomes free. You know, uh, I mean, becomes, you know, independent again and becomes fun again. We, I think we can make it more user friendly. And that's what we're working on you with BitKit, uh, my, my, myself and my team with Relay and a lot of other great like Blockstream and Breeze with Lightning, etc. I think. That's so I have a question when internally when Relay talks about, you know, product features and, and the climate of things like kind of like we're talking about now, um, where do you place stable coins? and you know uh you know trusted trusted monies into your conversations like we talked about like etfs and banks and like total custodial but we have also this kind of pseudo pseudo custodial situation with things like tether and tether tokens mm -hmm. the the one of the issues being that Tether isn't actually popular on Bitcoin. It's not even popular on Liquid. So it's a little further removed from our culture in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you know, as, as we were talking about before we started the call, like Tether is still an, an impressive amount of usage and impressive amount of money in there. Um, and so when you think about something like Lightning, you think, okay, like part of the interest in Lightning is, okay, like I think we're all confident it would be useful for like B2B settlement and reducing on-chain footprint for like repetitive high frequency transacting. And we're all hoping and trying to make it something that's also good for retail and merchants. Yeah. But like, we also are faced with the, the evidence of how Tether is probably making more headway than Lightning is in that area. Um, and so stable coins or trusted tokens. Um, and so, when do you guys talk about these kinds of things as well in this context? Yeah, yeah for sure. A lot. So I think this is just a matter of uh, long term, maybe even decades of development. And we try to work on the future where it, it hopefully all kind of ends or what, what will be the outcome of these whole developments where, you know, ETF and custodial Bitcoin is now probably still the biggest, the biggest thing then uh, stable coins um, are are kind of a stepping stone into the fully fledged Bitcoin, pure Bitcoin future, hopefully, um, and stable coins on Bitcoin, um, and and that's what we uh, are working on. What we're trying to uh, push is that we we always try to bring as many people as possible um, in an easy, as easy and fast and cheap. Um, manner as possible to bitcoin but to the real bitcoin which for us is bitcoin only and non-custodial mm -hmm. um, and i think stable coins can be a way to get there to bring if, if we bring more people on um on on a bitcoin etf and on uh, custodial exchanges and on stable coins it's already one step away from the fiat system and one step towards the bitcoin system it's still not in, in our ideal camp, but it's one step. And I think from there, it's probably then easier to go to, okay, you know, th th this is a learning process also for people. And it's like a migration process that has maybe different uh, stepping stones. And we're just working on the ideal thing 
just Bitcoin only, non-custodial, Lightning, and different layers for um, scalability, uh, scaling uh, Bitcoin to the whole world, and might involve other assets like stable coins, etc., on Bitcoin. Just in the end, Bitcoin is this um, uh, this value network that can have all sorts of values and transaction of different values on on top of it and host these transactions um but uh, in in a way where it's neutral decentralized global accessible for everyone controlled by no one etc mm-hmm. does that make sense it it does i'll just for the sake of me making it interesting i'll take the other side and i'll say like do you think like i don't see a lot of evidence like I've heard this from people that promote custodial solutions or pseudo custodial solutions that you can, this is a great opportunity to take people that are no coiners, turn them into Bitcoin investors and then put them on the path of self custody. Mm -hmm. But I don't see a lot of good examples of success of that path, right? Like I'm sure it happens, but it doesn't seem like this is a very, actually that common of a thing for people to go from keeping all their Bitcoin in exchange to holding it themselves. That's, that's a very good, I, I don't know, like the data, I see different data and I think it's not clear. I, I, I see statistics of like, oh, in the last 10 years or like last five years, um, less and less Bitcoin are on exchanges, more and more Bitcoin are in self-custody, etc. But then I also see the other, exactly the other story that you described now. What, what I can see see or what i what i see we don't see a lot more nodes being run that's one area of evidence that's that's one piece of clear data at least but <laughs> so what i see in like our daily business and talking to our users and what they what they do and and also bigger clients like in, in relay private we we deal with uh, seven figure or even eight figure clients that really put a lot of money of their money into bitcoin we we do see that there is a, a, a development that happens and a mindset change that's hap- that happens individually that they start first with shit coins on, on a custodial exchange. They then move to kind of more being Bitcoin only and seeing the shit coins only as like maybe, you know, a speculation you do with 10 or 20% of real wealth, but like the main thing, long-term saving you do in Bitcoin. And then also they start to learn about the... Um, uh, the, the advantages of having the Bitcoin actually in a self-custodial way, and then last but not least, also to have it on an, on a on hardware wallet. Uh, so, mm-hmm. and, and when- yeah, I guess when you have a lot of money, you have a lot more fear of losing it, and you yeah. there are people that will transfer that and say, "Well, it's safer with my hands." Um, so I, I could definitely see that for that demographic, and really for any demographic, I'm just more pay, playing devil's advocate in that, yeah. like. It's more of my bet that the incentives aren't quite there for the app that takes the person in to Bitcoin custodially to be the app that helps them into self-custody. Um, that that incentive is not quite there. And some custodial you know, proponents make that argument that, oh, we can always parlay them into a self-custodial app. Yeah, it's like, well, why would you do that? You know, like oh, yeah. you won't make money anymore. Like, it would be stupid. What they want is to yeah. keep as much money, as much asset under management as, as possible, right? That's true. Uh, that's why we The don't... other counter argument I wanted to bring up was that because... Tether is really the only popular stable coin. And because it's really only popular on shitcoin blockchains, I also feel that we, because we were talking about stable coins and I also feel that that's another tricky nuance with introducing stable coins into your solutions um, is that you also really create much more opportunity for altcoins to enter the person's view. And so like when you, you know, when you say, oh yeah, stable coins are practical or they have a use case, they're very popular. I could, I could see myself supporting, you know, uh, Tether or stable coin in our app somehow. But then when you go to research actually doing it, you realize you have to support an altcoin to do that mm-hmm. and to make that actually useful to anyone because nobody really accepts Tether on Bitcoin. 
it's barely even a thing anymore. Omni, I think, got delisted, and that's the only like tether on Bitcoin. Um, and so that's not even it's barely a thing. And then you have Tether and Liquid, and that's barely accepted as well too. That, that could change, but again, my just my general concern is when you bring stablecoins in the current paradigm into the picture, you also are bringing altcoins into the picture, which complicates this whole idea that you can take a person from being custodial to being a self-custodial Bitcoiner, because now. They're thinking, well, obviously, all coins are interesting, too, because that's where the tether comes from. Um, and so now they're like, well, maybe I should own some of those because this tether thing is pretty big and seems like it's relevant. You know, like and now all of a sudden their wallet has Tron, Tether, you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Lightning. And you're like, uh, you know, good luck. I, I don't know. Like, it, it's it's a really difficult thing to navigate. Yeah. Um, when, right. like when you're trying to, when you're trying to come from an ideal and say, what is the, what would be the best Bitcoin app, um, in today's, you know, climate. And you if you include, uh, all coins in that, it's like, I'm not all coins, uh, stable coins in that it's hard to not, you start making a lot of trade-offs and you start making conflicting decisions like, okay, we won't support all coins. So the one that will use liquid, well, liquid isn't really a layer either and you're kind of supporting a federation and That's if right. the federation becomes successful it could get shut down mm -hmm. um and so it's like your your choices are, are tr really tricky yeah. Yeah. like i think i think strike has supported uh, tether on ethereum um to be able to have tether support in some countries or something like that and that's that's another important point i think the only Uh, way I see us in uh, uh, adding uh, a stable coin is if it's like really on Bitcoin and maybe not even Tether, but like uh, uh, ta like Taro, you're probably following Taro, uh, which is the, the promise or the, the idea of really having stable coins on the, in, a, in a, as decentralized way as possible on Bitcoin and Lightning. And why is just because, not really because people demanded necessarily hey we want altcoins on on um relay because that wouldn't really make sense anyway because they're sending us fiat and get bitcoin why would they send fiat to get also fiat to <laughs> some another you know? yeah i think stable coins get a lot less interesting when the on-chain fees are 25 dollars and higher as well yeah yeah <laughs> um, because we're, we're trying to say oh stable coins help with lower cost stuff but then if you put them in bitcoin that's not true anymore Yeah, like, first we need to solve the and then you say, oh, well, well, we'll put them on Lightning too. And you say, okay, well, now you remember all that like really complicated user experience you wanted to support. Um, now you want to, on top of it, put the tarot system. And so you're going to have more fragility, more complexity. And furthermore, you have to do a conversion to hop between the asset and Lightning. And so now you're injecting exchanges and centralization into it. And so is Taro actually going to work as a solution for getting Tether or, or a major stablecoin on Bitcoin? I'm actually pretty skeptical because I, I think it ends up too centralized, regulated, and too expensive, like, and probably also too complex. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's a, like an ideal world thinking. Ideally, in five years or 10 years, the Bitcoin will be with different layers, really scalable. And you will have almost instant, almost for free, kind of the lightning promise transaction, right? And if we achieve that, and once we achieve that, then I think there could also be a nice value add in having stable coins on Bitcoin, etc., on all these uh, stacks. Because then what you could have is on Relay, basically you could have um, a, a stable coin, whatever your fiat currency is where you live, and you can deposit this, But it's already it's it's already non-custodial, which is great. And then instantly, within seconds, you can swap it to Bitcoin. That's that's something that a lot of our users demand. But we don't serve yeah. currently because we don't want to hold the fiat currency on behalf of our Bitcoin. But this, if there was a way for people to kind of deposit fiat, um, but hold it themselves and then switch it whenever they uh, want to Bitcoin, then that would be something that I think our user base would like. But It's not necessary for our case because in the end we're long-term uh, saving into Bitcoin. That's our thing. And, and that already works very well. We're growing. We have a 
great uh, user base that is happy. So I, th I don't think it's necessary for us, but there could be, if, if it works and if it solves that particular use case, then I see ourselves maybe adding um, something uh, like stable coins, but definitely not like on Ethereum or like the, the, that would be yeah. no, uh, uh, too much. That would be too much uh, away from our principles. Yeah, I just wanted to pick your brain on it a little bit and, and play the other side because it, it's something we've been uh, researching a lot ever since the beginning of Synonym. Where like one of the ways that I even met Paulo was that I had convinced him and Oleg from Folger to invest in reviving the RGB project because the the main developer had left at the time and I was still working at BitRefill back then and I was like oh we really need tokens on Lightning and I you know explained to them all this and they said oh well you can kind of you can do this with RGB and they talked about it and I was like all right well let's make RGB a thing again and went all for that and um, I guess the the other area of interest here is just maybe there's a way to do the stablecoin stuff without a blockchain. And that's more my area of interest is mm -hmm. because of when you take the idea that what makes it interesting on shit coins is that it doesn't cost anything. Um, mm -hmm. it, that's really the main thing. <laughs> I mean, you could argue DeFi too, but this is more like Ponzi schemes. And I guess Ponzi scheme, we can have Ponzi schemes on Bitcoin too, if we want, like, that's not, that's not the hard part. Um, but yeah. It, it, and so the issue with the vision of all these layers eventually being able to be how Bitcoin scales is they're all still limited by the on-chain scale. And like, as, as example, like the, the experience of creating a lightning channel gets a lot worse and, or having a lightning channel gets a lot worse when the fees are really high. Closing your channel gets to be more risky, more tricky. Um, not, you know, the, the size of your channel become, you know, your channels have to be bigger when the, when the fees are higher, um, things like this. And so be, you always need to hope that on-chain will scale to your needs too, because your layer becomes useful at a certain, useless at a certain threshold. Both need to scale, right? Uh, in order to work, so on chain and lightning. So uh, one question you you maybe can answer: Do you think slicing will be a solution to a lot of these problems? Because uh, slicing, splicing, sorry, <laughs> splicing. So then you can basically re uh, no. uh, channels, etc. The thing with splicing is you may be able to save the quantity of on chain transactions, but they are on chain transactions. So I'm already speaking of the ideal. I'm saying, let's assume the user only ever needs one lightning channel and that's all they can afford. Even in that, even if you make that assumption, you say, okay, because that's the assumption that most likely to tolerate the highest fee, right? So you say the highest fee a person might tolerate would be the most utility out of that fee. Like, okay, I'll pay a hundred dollars for a lightning channel if I know I can use it two years or a year or however long you know is important to me. That's that's what you're working with, right? Um, lost lost where I was going with that <laughs> again, but yeah, the, the you can't. So if you can't justify that fee, then and you can't fit it into there. It doesn't fit in any situation. You know what I mean? Because it's just like now I'm excluded as soon as the fee is out of my reach, and so we have to figure out keeping that initial user experience where even if I'm only making one transaction just to onboard, that that's tolerable. Never mind splicing where, because splicing is just saying, instead of closing my channel and opening a new one or having two, which might involve, you know, one or two transactions or more even, let's just do a splice. So it's, it's just one transaction, but splices are on-chain transactions. So you still have to pay that on-chain fee to splice. So it doesn't provide you any special scale so much as if you're doing multiple on-chain operations, you may be able to do less if you're careful. Yeah, yeah, got it. Oh my God, it's so complicated still. Why are you still working on this? It's so good. Why, why don't you work on this? <laughs> I, I think people would be depressed to know how often we ask ourselves that. Um, <laughs> but no, we are so lucky. Well, well, the answer is simple. It's still the best thing that we have. Like, it's still the only Bitcoin scaling layer that exists, no matter how complex it is. It's it's the only thing worth working on other than like, I don't want to have a company that works on on-chain scaling proposals. I, I just don't want to be the guy, be that guy making proposals for on-chain. It's, it's very uh, 
disappointing when you don't get your way and it's very dangerous when you do so it's not really my area i want to be involved in well said well said well thank you john for for your time it's really this was really like we can go on for ages and it's a it's a super complex topic but i think it's it's the thing that you know creates uh, the financial system that we want for the future and obviously it's hard it's obviously it's not going to be easy right but it's it's definitely worth it uh one last question i have for you i have for all my guests uh, you don't have to answer of course but i ask all of the guests and most of them actually answer which i find cool so you're you're into bitcoin uh what percentage of your wealth do you store in bitcoin I, I've said this before, so I don't mind sharing, but I keep one month of fiat. That's all I keep. And everything else is in Bitcoin. So every month I, I sell enough Bitcoin to pay my bills and that's it. Uh -huh. That's somehow sounds very reasonable to me, but it's still very reckless. It's still crazy. It's still like, uh, you know, probably a big chunk of your total wealth, maybe even more than, you know, 80, 90% is in Bitcoin. But still you keep some, you know, one month of, okay. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I keep the month of fiat because I have to, not as a hedge. It's just because that, like, it's just impractical for me to like try to sell Bitcoin every time somebody who doesn't accept Bitcoin needs to be paid. That's not practical. So, uh, once once a month is doable. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much, John, for coming on. See you in Madeira, hopefully. Thank you too. Looking forward to it. Cheers, man. Thanks.